Are you guys ready to hear the story of Inanna's descent to the netherworld? I'm going to partly read from it directly and partly tell it myself. But there are elements in it, <clears throat> in the writing, that I think, I think are fun to talk about. Because there is the plot of the story, obviously, but then there are the, the literary elements of the way that the story is told. And that gets lost when we're just kind of summarizing the plot. Even though in English, usually, that's what we're about. The plot. You know, if a sentence isn't moving the story forward, you get rid of it. You don't repeat the same sentence over and over. It's just not something we do in English literature, English language. So, do you guys hear that? Oh, he just opened the door. Shoo, shoo, bad dog. Look at this man right here. Oh my God, his head is so big. Now, to return to our story, Inanna's descent to the netherworld. As an epic, it's more of a song. It's a poem song that tells a story. This is a still a common practice in the Near East and the Middle East. Uh, Arabs often record their history via poem songs and poets are often the political and official spokes people of the population someone like Mahmoud Darwish and the Palestinian people for example so Inanna's descent begins as follows from the great heaven, she set her mind on the great below. From the great heaven, the goddess set her mind on the great below. From the great heaven, Inanna set her mind on the great below. My mistress abandoned heaven, abandoned earth, and descended to the netherworld. Inanna abandoned heaven, abandoned earth, and descended into the underworld. So the first thing we know is that someone who worships Inanna, or works for, perhaps, Inanna, is telling us this story someone who refers to Inanna as my mistress. Inanna has left the great above in search of the great below. Then they tell us that she abandoned all of her offices, the office of En, abandoned the office of Lagar, descended to the underworld, abandoned the Ayanna in Unug and descended to the underworld, abandoned the Mukkalama, in Battibira and descended to the underworld. She abandoned the Giguna in the Zabalam and descended to the underworld. And so on and so on. And this is this tells us Inanna is revered and is counted on and loved and sought out all across the kingdom, all across the world in all of these different temples, of all of these different places, having abandoned her kingdoms above, her kingdoms in the heavens, in search of the below, setting her mind on the below, she took the seven divine powers, collected the, vi the divine powers and grasped them in her hand and with the good divine powers, she went on her way. She put a turban, headgear for the open country on her head, took a wig to her forehead, and hung small lapis lazuli beads around her neck. And of course she was going to take the divine powers because 
she knew what was going to happen. She knew how things worked. Now, in the next line, so right now what she's doing is preparing herself. So one of her followers is telling us this story and they've begun by first forecasting what's going to happen. They're telling us first that, you know, this is the story of when Inanna left and went to the underworld. She set her mind on the below and she left. She forgot about everything she has going on right here on earth, all the temples, all the things that we're counting on her for. She went down. And this is how she prepared herself. First, she took the seven divine powers, collected them in her hand, went on her way. She was wearing a turban and a wig and lapis lazuli, beads around her neck. She placed twin egg-shaped beads on her breast, covered her body with a pala dress, a garment of ladyship. She placed mascara, which is called, let a man come, let him come, on her eyes. She pulled the pectoral, which is called, come man come, over her breast. She placed a golden ring on her hand and held the lapis lazuli measuring rod and measuring line in her hand. And Inanna traveled towards the underworld and her minister, Ninkubura, traveled behind her. So before I keep going, I wanna comment on what Inanna is wearing and all of these things that she's taking with her and why the mascara is called let a man come and come man come. Inanna and Ishtar, while being goddesses of fertility, are also goddesses of war. There are stories about how Ishtar as a queen on earth was really good at war. She was really good at winning wars. And part of the battle was facing her and facing her beauty. And she was known, and lots of queens, I guess, from this time who led wars and led people into war, they were known to wear very elaborate jewelry and robes and put on makeup to seduce the enemy, essentially, to seduce kings during negotiations, to seduce um, soldiers on the field. And she's gotten all dressed up. She's got her seven divine powers. She has everything with her, and she's traveling towards the underworld with her minister, Nin Kubura, who, by the way, is also a woman. And Honi Inanna says to Nin Kubura, and we see this repetition again. Come, my faithful minister of Eyanna, my minister who speaks fair words, my escort who speaks trustworthy words, I am going to give you instructions. My instructions must be followed. I am going to say something to you. It must be observed. On this day, I will descend to the underworld. When I have arrived in the underworld, make a lament for me on the ruined mounds. Beat the drum for me in the sanctuary. Make the rounds of the houses of the gods for me. Lacerate your eyes for me. Lacerate your nose for me. Lacerate your ears for me in public. In private, <laughs> lacerate your buttocks for me. Like a pauper, clothe yourself in a single garment and alone set your foot in the Yikur house of Enlil. This is what I need you to do for me. One, two, and three. You need to get real sad and you need to go around to the houses of the gods and ask for their help. 
Now she tells her to see several gods. All She wants her to go all around to all the gods and then ask in the end, Father Enki. And with every god, she repeats the same prophecy, almost. The same foreboding or the same anticipation. Um, she basically tells her every time, this is what you'll say, but expect him to reject you. And when he rejects, when he rejects you, go to this man and tell him this and anticipate that he will reject you. And when he rejects you, go to this man. So, for example, you go to the house of Enlil, lament before Enlil, say, Father Enlil, don't let anyone kill your daughter in the underworld. Don't let your precious metal be alloyed there with the dirt of the underworld. Don't let your precious lapis lazuli be split there with the mason's stone. Don't let your boxwood be chopped up there with the carpenter's wood. Don't let young lady Inanna be killed in the underworld. And if Enlil does not help you in this matter, go to Urim, in the Yamedkura at Urim. When you have entered the Ekiknujan, House of Nanna, lament before Nanna. Father Nanna, don't let anyone kill your daughter in the underworld. Don't let your precious metal be alloyed there with the dirt of the underworld. And it continues and continues. And then again, if Inanna does not help you, go to Edidug, go to Enki. And in the end, Father Enki, Lord of Great Wisdom, knows about the life-giving plant and the life-giving water. He is the one who will restore me to life. Now, why did she need to have her go all around to all of the different gods first? I think we could look at it in several ways, obviously. There, and you know, there are probably infinite ways of interpreting why. First, for the poetry, so that they could repeat that particular line, Father Gaza, don't let anyone kill your daughter in the underworld. Don't let your precious metal be alloyed there with the dirt of the underworld. When a line is repeated over and over again, it's meant to hit you deeper every time. So there is this uh, type of music in the Arabic culture. Um, I don't know if actually this exists in other cultures. If it exists in your culture, let me know in the comments. But there is this um, practice, this type of song or genre of song, where the one line or the one stanza will be repeated over and over to emphasize its message and to hit over and over. It becomes like a meditation, like a just a meditative trigger that you repeat over and over and you get lost in the tarab. It's called tarab. Um, you get lost in the tarab of it. He's trying to open the door again, but it's locked. So let's see what happens. Anyways, um, so for example, there's this great song I think by Wadi Asafi. I could be wrong. If anybody Arabic is in the audience, correct me. But it's called A Garden of Flowers. And the whole song is him saying, me and my lover are in a garden. And the flowers encircle us all around. My lover and I are in a garden and the flowers encircle us all around.
over and over and over and over. And like I said, every time, it just hits you a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper. And that's what they're doing with this line. Besides, of course, you know, the marketing. Maybe Inanna is promoting herself. Just reminding everybody that um, if you forgot about me, I'm still here. Actually, I'm in the underworld, so if you do want me to still be here, maybe save me. But also, the alchemical elements. Don't let your precious metal be alloyed there with the dirt of the underworld. What I read in that, in terms of an alchemical learning, is that we need to travel to the depths. We need to go to the underworld. But we need to be careful not to let it become us or to not allow ourselves to get too comfortable there. But anyways, Inanna asks of her minister, Ninkubura, to within three days do the rounds on the gods, reach Enki, let him know what's going on, get the life-giving plant and the life-giving water from him, and restore me to life. Because he's the one. He is the Lord of Great Wisdom, Enki. Now when Inanna traveled onwards to the underworld, her minister Ninkubura traveled on behind her. She said to her minister Ninkubura, Go now, my Ninkubura, and pay attention. Don't neglect the instructions I gave you. We finished with the intro. Ninkubura is on her way back. Inanna has now arrived at the palace Ganser. And she pushes aggressively on the door of the underworld. And she shouts aggressively at the gate of the underworld. Open up, doorman. Open up. Open up, Neti. Open up. I am all alone. And I want to come in. Before we get to the response and continue, a little side note. In the Ishtar myth, the sister and her workers all know that Inanna has a secret plan, and that is that she wants to take over the underworld. This story only suggests that a tiny bit in the beginning when they say that Inanna had set her mind on the below. As in, everything that she had so far was not enough. She also wanted to rule the underworld. She starts yelling, let me in, open up, let me in. Neti, the chief doorman of the underworld, answered, holy Inanna. Who are you? I am Inanna, going to the east. If you are Inanna, going to the east, why have you traveled to the land of no return? How did you set your heart on the road whose traveler never returns? So like I said before, Inanna knows the rules of the underworld. She knows that she can't just play around with this kind of thing. She can't just go and come back. Thank you, by the way, you guys, for all the gifts. So, there's already something fishy going on. So, Holy Inanna answers, Because Lord Gudgalana, the husband of my elder sister, Holy Erekigala, has died. In order to have his funeral rites observed, she must offer generous libations at his wake. That is his reason. That is the reason, sorry. So basically she's saying, well, I'm 
I'm here to tell her that her husband has passed and I gotta take her with me for the funeral. You know, that's all. That's that's the only reason I'm here. So Neti, a little suspicious, is like, you know what, stay here, Inanna. Let me speak to my mistress. I will speak to my mistress, Erekigala, and I'll tell her what you've said. So Neti enters the house of the mistress, Erekigala, and she goes, Mistress, there is a lone girl outside. It's Inanna, your sister, and she has arrived at the palace, Ganzer. She pushed aggressively on the door of the underworld. She shouted aggressively at the gate of the underworld. She has abandoned Eanna and has descended to the underworld. So they know who she is. They know who she is. And it is suspicious. Because, like, girl, why are you here? What's happening on earth? What's happening in the heavens? What's happening in Ayana? Neddy continues. He says, she has taken the seven divine powers, has collected the powers, grasped them in her hand, come on her way with all the good divine powers, again with the poetic repetition, telling her what she's wearing, the turban, the wig, the lapis lazuli around her neck, the twin eggs, the bada dress, the mascara, which is called let a man come on her eyes, the pectoral called come man come over her breast, the golden ring, the measuring rod, etc. And when she heard this, Eric Kigala slapped the side of her thigh, bit her lip, and took the words to heart meaning she didn't say what was on her mind and that she knew what Inanna was up to. She says, you know what, Neddy, my chief doorman of the underworld, do not neglect the instructions I give you. Sounds just like her sister, by the way. Let the seven gates of the underworld be bolted. Then let each door of the palace ganzer be opened separately. As for her, after she has entered and crouched down and had her clothes removed, they will be carried away. So what they're going to do, so what she's saying is that the palace ganzer, which apparently is the underworld, is enclosed by seven gates and they are to be opened one by one and at each door they will take something from her until there is nothing left so that she comes naked before her sister because for her to be dressed that way as i told you before to be taking up the seven divine powers in her hands to be wearing this way this mascara this makeup this jewelry means that she is getting ready for war. She wants to seduce. The image and the seduction is part of the battle. And her sister knows that, which is why she has her stripped. And at each door she comes to, there is the same repetition that we saw earlier, this time seven times. Each time something is taken from Inanna. Inanna says, what is this? And Neti says, be satisfied, Inanna. A divine power of the underworld has been fulfilled. Inanna, you must not open your mouth against the rights of the underworld. Every time, every time. They take the turban from her head. What is this? Be satisfied, Inanna. A divine power of the underworld has been fulfilled. Inanna, you must not open your mouth against the rights of the underworld. The twin-shaped beads are taken from her breast. What is this? 
be satisfied, Iranna. A divine power is being fulfilled in the underworld. Inanna, you must not open your mouth against the rights of the underworld. Version of Ishtar, um, this is told in more detail. The way that Ishtar runs for the throne. Now, the Anuna, the seven judges, rendered their decision against her. The council of judges is called. The council of judges being the Anuna. Seven judges and all seven rendered their decision against her. They looked at her, it was the look of death. They spoke to her, it was the speech of anger. They shouted at her, it was the shout of heavy guilt. The afflicted woman, found guilty, was turned into a corpse, and the corpse was hung on a hook. This is what has passed in the underworld since Inanna made her descent. In the meantime, what was Ninkubura up to? Well, when three days and three nights had passed, her minister, Ninkubura, who speaks fair words, who speaks trustworthy words, carried out the instructions of her mistress. What she's been doing, Ninkubura, is exactly what Inanna ordered her to do. So they're even repeated in the same language. It's almost like a chorus being repeated in a song. She made the lament for her in the house. She beat the drum. She made the rounds. She lacerated her eyes, lacerated her nose, lacerated her buttocks for her clothed herself in a single garment, set her foot into the Ikur, the house of, of Enlil. And when Enlil rejected her, she went to Urim, and after Urim, she went to Nanna, and Nanna, she spoke to Father Enki. Each one of the gods that Ninkubura speaks to responds in the same way. When she had entered the house of Eli, Enlil, she lamented before Enlil, and in his rage, Father Enlil answered Ninkubura. He said, My daughter craved the great heaven, and she craved the great below as well. Inanna craved the great heaven, and she craved the great below as well. The divine powers of the underworld are divine powers which should not be craved. For whoever gets them must remain in the underworld. Who having got to that place could then expect to come up again. And thus Father Enlil did not help in this manner, in this matter, and so she went to Uri. And again, she makes the lament, and the house of Nanna, and laments before he's trying to open the door again, but it's locked this time. Yes, let's stop for a second and comment on this. Inanna craved the great heaven and she craved the great below as well. That's another clue that Inanna wanted to rule the underworld, that she was hungry for more power. Baby! Ya Allah, let me open. I want you to meet somebody, okay? He's the newest addition to our our kitty family. Oh, look at it! It's so small. I'm gonna let him down, but isn't he beautiful? Can I close the door? Hi, Yushka. Hi. 
the man you saw earlier, the door opener, that is his father slash uncle. We adopted a brother and sister and they had a baby. His mom was here. Beyonce, Beyonce, let's go back to our story. As I was saying, Ninkobura was going around. She made the rounds of the houses of the gods, presenting the lament of Inanna. I did name my cat Beyonce. As Inanna had anticipated and had told her to expect, most of them refused to help her. Why? Because she chose this. All of them say the same thing. My daughter craved the great heaven and she craved the great below as well. The divine powers of the underworld are divine powers which should not be craved. For whoever gets them must remain in the underworld. And this goes back, relates back to the alchemical observation that we made a little while ago, earlier in the story, on the idea of the metal being alloyed. And this is echoed in the more modern Greek story, right? Um, when Zeus tells Demeter that, all right, fine, we will let her out as long as she hasn't eaten anything. If she has eaten anything from his garden, she has to stay. All of the gods tell her the same thing. My daughter chose this and she already knows that she don't fuck with the great below until she gets to Enki. She does the lament for Enki and says in the end, don't let young lady Inanna be killed in the underworld. And Enki says something different than the others. Enki says, what has my daughter done? She has me worried. What has Inanna done? She has me worried. What has the mistress of all the lands done? She has me worried. What has the Hierodule of An done? She has me worried. He removed some dirt from the tip of his fingernail and created the Kurjara. He removed some dirt from the tip of his other fingernail and created the Galatura. To the Kurjara, he gave the life-giving plant. To the Galatura, he gave the life-giving water. Notice what Enki calls Inanna, these names mistress of all the lands, Hyrodule of An. So he gives to Galatura, he creates Galatura and Kurjara out of the, some of the dirt in his fingernails to say that's how, <clears throat> that's how easy it is for him. You take the water, you take the plant, go save this woman. She's gonna be the end of me, this girl. Enki gives the Galatura and Kurjara, the instructions. And he says, here's what you do. You go and direct your steps to the underworld. Flip past the door like flies. Slip through the door pivots like phantoms. The mother who gave birth at Ekigala <clears throat> on account of her children is lying there. Her holy shoulders are not covered by a linen cloth. Her breasts are not full like a Kagan vessel. Her nails are like a pickaxe upon her. The hair on her head is bunched up as if it were leeks. So she's this very ugly underworld goddess character. And he's telling the little spirits he just made how to recognize her. You'll recognize her, okay? She's the, she's the creepiest looking one. She's creepy AF. Everything about her is creepy, bro. Just gonna take a second to have a little water. 
Um, how are you guys doing? Enki creates the little spirits from the dirt under his fingernail and gives them the life-giving water and life-giving plant and prepares them for the plan. Gives them a plan on how to get Inanna's corpse back from Erikigala. And what he tells them is that she just gave birth and she's going to be really sick. So you're going to hear her say things. And here's what you're going to say in response. So when she says, oh my heart, you say to her, you are troubled, our mistress. Oh, your heart. And when she says, oh my liver, you say to her, you are troubled, our mistress. Oh, your liver. And then she'll say, who are you? I tell you from my heart to your heart, from my liver to your liver, if you are gods, I'll talk to you. If you're mortals, may a destiny be decreed for you. They made her swear this by heaven and earth. They, and then it cuts off. She is in pain and they are gonna offer to help her feel better. And they are required to ask her for Inanna's body, Inanna's corpse in return. But she's gonna offer them several things first. As Anki tells us earlier, they were offered a river with its water, they did not accept it. They were offered a field with its grain, they did not accept it. They said, give us the corpse hanging on the hook. And she said, that is your queen's corpse. And they said, whether it's of our king or our queen, we don't know, just give it to us. And they were given the corpse and one of them sprinkled the life-giving plant and the other sprinkled the life-giving wa water. And Inanna thus arose. After she rises, she ceased. And Erekigala says to the Gala Tura and Kurjara that your queen has been seized. Inanna was about to leave the underworld, but just as she was about to ascend, the Anuna, remember them from earlier, the judges, the seven judges of the underworld, they seize her. And they are mad. They say, who has ever ascended from the underworld? Who has ascended unscathed from the underworld? If Ananna is to ascend from the underworld, let her provide a substitute for herself. She has to find a replacement. She can't just leave the underworld. No one just ascends from the underworld. When she left, she left with a host of demons from the underworld. The one in front of her, though not a minister, held a scepter in his hand. The one behind her, though not an escort, carried a mace at his hip. While the small demons, like a reed enclosure, and the big demons, like the reeds of a fence, restrained her on all sides. So she went with a whole convoi, a whole set of security and bodyguards, demon bodyguards. And they describe them a little bit for us in this uh, myth. Those who accompanied her, those who accompanied Inanna, know no food, know no drink, eat no flower offering, and drink no libation. They accept no pleasant gifts. They never enjoy the pleasures of the marital embrace. Never have any sweet children to kiss. They tear away the wife from a man's embrace. They snatch the son from a man's knee. They make the bride leave the house of her father-in-law. They take the wife from a man's embrace. They take away the child hanging on a wet nurse's breast. 
They crush no bitter garlic. They eat no fish. They eat no leeks. They, it was, who accompanied Inanna. So these are some really dark forces accompanying Inanna back to the earth. And I'm, if we're going to read it in a psycho-spiritual way, we might read it as the baggage that we sometimes bring back from with us from our shadow work, work that is still unfinished, that we think is finished, but there is more waiting for us. When she had ascended from the underworld, Ninkubura was there waiting. And as soon as she saw her, they say she threw herself at the feet of the door of Ganser, sat in the dust and closed herself, clothed herself in filthy garment. And the demon said, Inanna, proceed to your city. We'll take her. And Inanna was like, of course not. Of course you're not gonna take my minister, my minister of fair words my escort of trustworthy words, my escort who did not forget my instructions. She did not neglect the orders that I gave her. She made a lament for me on the ruined mounds. She beat the drum for me in the sanctuaries. She made the rounds of the gods' houses for me, lacerated her eyes, lacerated her nose, lacerated her ears, lacerated her buttocks for me clothed herself in a single garment. This is like the fourth time we hear this. And we're coming at a conclusion too, at the conclusive part of the song. So elements from the beginning of the song are being brought back with a more force and more power and more pride here to save uh, Ninkubura's life, to save her from being taken by the demons. She doesn't want to give away her minister. She loves her minister. And then they go to the next city and her friend, another friend of hers, throws himself at her feet. And the demons are like, great, continue to your city, Inanna. We'll take this one. And she said, no, of course not. Of course not. No. Kara is my singer, my manicurist, my hairdresser. How could I turn him over? Let's go on. Let's just, let's keep going. You're not going to take my beautician. That's what Inanna said. Okay, babes? So they continue. And again, Lulal, in his own city, threw himself at her feet. And the demons were like, Tamim, let's take Lulal. Thank you. She said, excuse me? Lulal? You can't take Lulal. Outstanding Lulal. He follows me at my right and my left. How could I turn him to you? Let's go on. Let's continue. Finally, they reached the great apple tree in the plain of Kulaba. And there was Dumuzid, who in the Ishtar myth is Tammuz, who in Arabic means June. So in the plain of Kulaba, there was Dumuzid, clothed in a magnificent garment, seated magnificently on a throne. The demon sees him there by his thighs. Seven of them pour milk from his churns. Seven shook their heads. They would not let the shepherd play the pipe and flute before her. She looked at him. It was the look of death. She spoke to him. It was the speech of anger. She shouted at him. It was the shout of heavy guilt. How much longer? Take him away. Holy Inanna gave Dumuzid the shepherd into their hands. Note, there are bits of this part missing. And in the Ishtar myth, again, um, here, they make it very clear that Ishtar is angry, that Tammuz is very comfortable without her. He's just sitting on his throne, laughing, eating, chilling with his buddies while she was in the underworld. Like he didn't even notice that she was gone. 
and out of her anger, she sends him in her place. Here, it's almost like it's suggested, but it's not as clear. But we know this because she looks at him with the look of death, speaks to him with the speech of anger, shouts at him with the heavy guilt, and then asks the demons, like, how long is this going to take? Why is he still here? And Muzid let out a wail and turned very pale. And he raised his hands to heaven and prayed to Utu, Utu, you are my brother-in-law. I am your relation by marriage. I brought butter to your mother's house. I brought milk to Ningal's house. Turn my hands into snakes and my feet into snakes so I can escape my demons. Let them not keep hold of me. And Utu accepted his tears. He turned Umuzid's hands into snake's hands and his feet into snake's feet. And he escaped his demons. But they ceased. And here we have dots. We're not sure what's happening until Holy Inanna wept bitterly for her husband. So even though it looked like he got away, something happened and he didn't get away entirely. And she weeps bitterly for her husband, um, knowing essentially in the Ishtar myth, she realizes that she made a decision in anger and weeps for her husband. Here, she just weeps for her husband, tears at her hair like Esparto grass, rips it out like the grass. And she starts going around to the women of the town of the kingdoms. You wives who lie in your men's embrace, where is my precious husband? You children who lie in your men's embrace, where is my precious child? Where is my man? Where is my man? Where is my man? A fly speaks to Holy Inanna. The fly says, if I show you where your man is, what will be my reward? And Inanna says, if you show me where my man is, I will give you this gift. I will cover dot, dot, dot. The fly helped Holy Inanna and Inanna decreed the destiny of the fly. In the beer house and tavern, may there be something for you. You will live like the sons of the wise. That's as far as we know between Inanna and the fly and this deal that she made. We don't know what she saw. We don't know what she gave the fly. The end says she was weeping. She came up to the sister and something by the hand and said, now alas, you for half the year and your sister for half the year. When you are demanded, on that day you will stay. In the Ishtar myth, this is Erekigala speaking to Dumuzid, who has made an appeal to her to let him leave. And he was weeping, so she came to him and his sister and said, you will stay for half the year and your sister for half the year. When you are demanded, on that day you will stay. When your sister is demanded, on that day you will be released. And thus, Holy Inanna gave Dumuzid as a substitute. Holy Erekigala, sweet is your praise. That's the last line. The last line belongs to Erekigala, queen of the underworld. The first line belongs to Inanna, queen of the heavens. Let's talk. I'm sure you noticed the parallels, obviously between, you know, the little parallels with the story of Christ, um, the three days, and the rising back, etc. But more, there are also the connections with Demeter and Persephone um, and Aphrodite, I believe. There was a version of the Demeter myth where Demeter goes to the gods 
yelling at Aphrodite because Aphrodite wants to rule the underworld via Persephone because Demeter goes to the gods and yells at Aphrodite saying, you can't get enough? Don't you ever get enough? And I really like that parallelism with the greed of Inanna and Ishtar and their need to rule the underworld as the overworld. This is a mythologization of Venus's journey in the sky, that periodic disappearance of Venus sometime around now or sometime between now and June. This whole season of spring in moving into summer on one level goes to show how beautiful our imagination is, how colorful our lives were at one point when we left room for that imagination. Because like contrary to popular belief, I was reading the other day about how the Greeks, at least by a certain era, knew that their myths were myths. They didn't believe their myths. They used them to describe their own lives. They spoke in metaphor, they communicated in metaphor. They didn't believe them. They didn't believe that they were physically real. Before monotheism, well, before Abrahamic religions, mythology was not dogmatic. Law and myth were not one thing. It wasn't Zeus himself who sent down the law on how to live your life. That wasn't a thing. Those two things were separated. There were laws, there were judicial systems, there were laws as old as Sumeria. Some of the oldest laws I think are from Sumeria, but they were not intertwined with the mythology and the folklore. There was a difference. And that to me means that there was something understood about the nature of mythology. It almost has something scientific to it, something practical to it. You know, you're not saying that Ishtar rose or disappeared or did this in this time to argue over all the little details of how long she stayed and whether or not she did this and whether she did that. There's no dogma around the story. The story is just to celebrate the fact that this is the season to plant, this is the season to sow, this is the season to harvest, to reap, to wait, to water, to feed, worship of the power that was available, the earth and its abundance, the space itself and the opportunity to interact with it and feed off of it. So it wasn't dogmatic, it was practical, not scientific, but not scientific and not practical pragmatic. It's almost like a pragmatic religion, a, a pragmatic mythology. With Abrahamic religions, we start to get dogma. Or even with a monotheism, like Zoroastrianism, for example, there start to be the only ways, the only right path, only God that needed to be believed in, and there was a sword to your neck if you didn't believe it. That wasn't a thing for a long time. That wasn't what people fought over. They didn't fight over their gods. They called on their gods to help them fight others. And whoever had the best god won, essentially. It becomes dogma when we get into the Abrahamics, and especially with Christianity. That shit spread the word and the sword together. And that's how he comes in the Revelation with swords coming out of his mouth to say that the word is the sword. All right. Talk to you guys later. Love you. Bye.